Welcome back to Study Squad. If this is your first time here, welcome. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so you'll always know when we post new videos. Today, we're diving into the fascinating world of economics. Ever wondered how money, goods, and services flow through an economy? Or what terms like GDP and GNI really mean? By the end of this video, you'll not only understand these concepts, but you'll also see how they impact your everyday life. So, grab a coffee, get comfortable, and let's get started. Let's start by understanding the five major players in any economy. Each of these participants plays a unique role in keeping the system running. Here's the breakdown. Households. Households are individuals and families, essentially all of us. We provide labor to businesses and earn wages in return. We also consume goods and services that businesses produce. For example, when you go to work, you're selling your labor. The paycheck you earn allows you to buy groceries, pay rent, or even save for a vacation. 2. Businesses. Businesses are the producers of goods and services. They rely on the labor provided by households to function. Think of your favorite bakery. They hire bakers to produce delicious bread and pastries. You buy those pastries, and the money you spend becomes the bakery's revenue. It's a win-win. 3. Financial Institutions Banks and other financial organizations help keep the economy running by managing savings, loans, and investments. For instance, when you save money in a bank, that money doesn't just sit there. Banks use it to provide loans to businesses and individuals, fueling economic activity. It's like a cycle of trust that keeps the gears turning. For the government, governments collect taxes from households and businesses and use that money to provide public goods and services, like roads, schools, and hospitals. For example, when you pay taxes, part of that money might go toward building a new public park or maintaining infrastructure. These investments benefit everyone. 5. The Foreign Sector No economy operates in isolation. The foreign sector represents the trade and financial interactions between countries. Think about it. When South Africa exports gold or imports electronics, it's engaging with the global economy. This exchange helps countries specialize and benefit from goods they don't produce domestically. All these players interact through what's called the circular flow model. Let me explain how it works. Households provide labor to businesses, and businesses pay wages in return. Businesses produce goods and services, which households buy using the wages they've earned. Money flows from households to businesses, while goods and services flow in the opposite direction. It's a continuous loop that keeps the economy running. But there's more to it. This simple cycle gets more complex when we include the government, financial institutions, and the foreign sector. The government collects taxes from households and businesses. This is considered a leakage because it removes money from the circular flow. But the government also injects money back into the economy through spending on public goods and services, like healthcare or infrastructure. Financial institutions add another layer. They channel savings from households and provide loans to businesses, helping fund investments and expansion. The foreign sector connects the domestic economy to the global market. Exports bring money into the economy, while imports send money out. This creates a flow of goods, services, and money across borders. Let's talk about markets, the places where all this interaction happens. There are two main types of markets in an economy. One, the goods market. This is where businesses sell goods and services to households. It includes everything from buying a loaf of bread at a supermarket to streaming your favorite show online. Two, the factor market. This is where factors of production, like labor, land, and capital, are traded. For example, when you work a job, you're participating in the factor market by selling your labor. Your salary is the payment you receive in return. In both markets, there are two flows happening at the same time. The real flow involves goods, services, or factors of production moving between participants. The monetary flow involves money moving in the opposite direction. For example, when you buy a cup of coffee, the money you spend becomes income for the coffee shop, while the coffee becomes your product. It's a simple exchange, but it's part of the larger system. Now, let's dive into GDP, or gross domestic product, 
one of the most important indicators of an economy's health. So, what exactly is GDP? GDP is the total market value of all final goods and services produced within a country's borders in a specific time period. There are three ways to calculate GDP. 1. The Product Approach This adds up the value of all goods and services produced. 2. The Expenditure Approach This adds up all spending in the economy by households, businesses, the government, and the foreign sector. 3. The Income Approach this adds up all income earned by producers, like wages, profits, and rents. GDP is useful, but it's not perfect. It has limitations. It doesn't show income inequality. A country with a high GDP could still have a large gap between the rich and poor. It also doesn't account for unpaid work, like volunteering or caregiving, or underground economic activities. And finally, it doesn't measure environmental sustainability or the quality of life. Now let's talk about GNI, or Gross National Income. GNI measures the total income earned by a country's citizens and businesses, whether they're at home or abroad. For example, if a South African company earns profits overseas, that's added to GNI. But if a foreign company earns profits in South Africa, that's subtracted. This makes GNI different from GDP. While GDP focuses on production within a country's borders, GNI focuses on income earned by its nationals. Both GDP and GNI are important, but they tell us different things about an economy. Here's the bottom line. Neither GDP nor GNI tells us everything. A country might have a high GDP, but if most of the wealth is concentrated in the hands of a few, the average person might still struggle to make ends meet. This is why economists also look at measures like income distribution, poverty rates, and the Human Development Index to get a fuller picture of economic health. So, to sum it all up, the circular flow model explains how money, goods, and services move through the economy. GDP measures the total value of goods and services produced, while GNI measures the income earned by a country's citizens. Both are valuable tools, but they have their limitations, they don't account for wealth distribution, informal economies, or sustainability. Thanks for sticking with me. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and subscribe to Study Squad for more easy to understand explanations. Drop a comment below if you have questions or suggestions for future topics. See you in the next video.